This is Med Ahmed. Here in Nigeria, Abuja. And um, we are here today to discuss a very important topic that concerns human trafficking. Human trafficking is a dangerous trap. And we are here to discuss and to create awareness about the dangers by exposing the tricks that these recruiters use to lure victims into their net. And um, I'm here today present with my boss, who is such a wonderful boss, and she is the assistant cultural affairs officer at the US Embassy, and she is Malia Hero. She'll be giving her welcome remarks very shortly. And Malia Hero has been a foreign service officer since September 2001. She has served in Brazil, she has served in Mozambique, Zambia, Guyana, South Africa, and now in Nigeria. Proud to joining the foreign office, the, the, the foreign service, Malia thought, Malia taught special education at the middle school level. She is passionate about education and youth. Malia is married to another foreign service officer and they have to is completing university in this year, 2021. And their daughter is completing her high, her high school also this year, 2021. I'll be turning this over to Malia to give her short remarks as she welcomes every one of you. Thank you. Malia, over to you, please. Thank you. Good morning. We're trying to maintain our social distancing, so there's some chair switching. Um, I have to be honest uh, that I was not sort of aware of the scope of this problem until I started to do some research. Uh, in in participate in anticipation of working on this panel, and what I found was um, just absolutely shocking to, to me. You know, forty more than forty million people are caught in the worldwide are caught in the trap of human trafficking, and it is a hundred and fifty billion dollar business annually, with uh, over a hundred billion of that money of the income for traffickers. Uh, coming from sexual exploitation or, or sex work. And 72% of the victims of human trafficking are women and children, are women and girls. So this is an enormous problem worldwide. And in Africa, you know, specifically, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of problems with, at least according to what I've read, with police not being fully trained, with cross-border cooperation, not being fully implemented and with people just in terrible, terrible circumstances and trying to improve their lives. But unfortunately that lands them in even worse circumstances. Um, one of the most shocking statistics I saw online was that one out of every 184 people worldwide some sort. And for the country of Nigeria, that means there's a million people in human trafficking situations. In 2016, 11,000 women were interviewed in Italy and they were, sex, they were caught in the sex work trap. And 80% of those women were Nigerians. So this was just, just quite shocking to me. It's the third most common crime in Nigeria. And that's just, that's just appalling. Um, the, one of the things I've asked, I reached out to some of our other coworkers who work specifically on this issue and said, you know, what is the embassy doing about this? What programs are we involved in? And uh, in 2000, I was told in 2020, in October of last year, they signed uh, USAID, the US Embassy, and uh, NATIP signed a very large agreement for a five-year program for a range of services, both through NAPTIP and through civil service organizations um, to work on this incredibly serious problem. And so I'd like to, although I'm 
I'm not an expert and I'm just learning about the extent of this problem now, although I've, I'm aware of this. Um, I'd like to thank the people, the very, very dedicated and hardworking people uh, who work on this pro program, on this problem every single day. Um, your work is, I'm sure, unsung and unappreciated, um, but very, very necessary and very important. So I'm going to turn it back over to my work colleague and to Judith, who is our, who are, is our moderator. And I hope that we do manage to raise some awareness and spotlight the important work that you're doing every single day. Margaret? Thank you. Thank you so much, Malia, for that um, beautiful opening remarks. Um, well, I'll be turning this over shortly to the moderator, who is uh, the so American coordinator. And to start with, I would like to mention that this program is actually in partnership with the American Space in Jaws, with the, um, with the, an, uh, an organization called the Deva Talk. Excuse me. With, the, with an organization called the Devatop and also the Kanempam Foundation. So we are all here together. And um, I'll be turning it over to the moderator who is Judith Henry, and she lectures at the Department of okay. Mass Communication um, and the of Trust. Her passion to give back to her community yeah. made her a volunteer at the American Space Jobs as Program Officer and okay. Education USA Advisor. So I'll be turning it to Judith to continue from here and after the Thank you so much. Judith. Thanks, Meg. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this auspicious program. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving us your time. Without waste of your time, I'm going to introduce our panelists who are going to be doing justice to this topic. They are going to be showing us the tricks traffickers use and what trafficking is all about. Um, our first uh, panelist is Joseph Osugwe. Joseph has been at the forefront combating trafficking in Nigeria, engaging over 300 volunteers on anti-human trafficking advocacy. In 2018, he was selected by the US government to participate in anti-human trafficking international visitors leadership program, the IVLP. At that time, he interacted with different agencies and examined their approach in human trafficking. Joseph is the executive director of DevTop Center for African Development and the initiator of TOCAM. His web link is www.tokam.org. Tokam is uh, spelled T-A-L-K-A-M.org. It's a human rights reporting mobile app. We can do well to download so we can follow what they do in their organization. Um, the next panelist who will be speaking after Joseph is known as Barista Emanuela Uzo Ndukwe. She's a multi-skilled individual with over 16 years experience in the private and public sector, working as a legal practitioner. Her interests include public enlightenment on topical issues for social change. She currently owns Aja and Sage Communications Limited, a media content, a media content production outfit, I beg your pardon, and consults for PAC Audiovisual Limited. Um, she writes empowering women and girls to inform them about trafficking. And she has a program titled Woman to Woman, a 30 minute weekly program that addresses gender-based issues aired on ASO Radio. 
Our platform gives our avenue to share the knowledge acquired from years of attending United Nations Commission on the status of women on, on the women's sessions. To address the rising incidence of human trafficking, Emanuela partnered with the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP, to initiate, produce, and present NAPTIP on the move, a successful weekly TV program popular for exposing traffickers and their wiles, amongst others. Her skills span across communications, public relations, media production, and legal drafting. Our third panelist is Kanen Rampam. She's the team leader of a community-based initiative driven by volunteers called the Kanen Rampam Foundation for Education Migration Awareness, KRP FEMA. The organization focuses on migration awareness, conflict transformation, social work, human trafficking, prevention education programs through gender equality, social accountability, and youth empowerment. She believes inclusion of women, youth, and the people with disabilities in electoral, political, and socioeconomic processes will promote peace, improve, and strengthen our economy. I'm going to turn it over now to Joseph Osigwe, who is our first panelist. He will be discussing um, a, a very important theme, which is understanding human trafficking network, the vulnerabilities and tricks used by recruiters. Please give uh, a thumbs up to Joseph. Uh, Joseph, please take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Judith. And I want to especially appreciate the US Embassy, Nigeria, and then the American Space just for organizing this uh, event. And uh, before I start, I also want to especially appreciate the US government for supporting our Talk of Human Rights project, which is making huge impact across 36 states in Nigeria. And I want to say that the US government has been committed to the fight against the human trafficking. I want to start first by saying, just giving a brief information about human trafficking, which I see as a trait in human beings for the purpose of exploitation. And, uh, in, and it is happening in every state in Nigeria. You know, years back, people think it's only when somebody is taken from a those states to Italy that is trafficking. That is actually a costly assumption. Trafficking is happening in every state in Nigeria. And on a personal standpoint, I, I see human trafficking as not just about exploitation, but also something that has harmed the dignity and the future of women, children, and, and youth. You know, traffickers use our guests and the women as if they are money generating machine. They use our boys and men as if they are tractors or, you know, and heavy duty uh, machines. And someone may wish to know uh, who are the traffickers. Of course, traffickers can be anyone, um, anyone who is directly or knowingly involved in recruitment and exploitation of. Uh, victims. Traffickers, they can be friends, they can be strangers, they can be employers, they can be parents, they can be religious leaders or animals. But traffickers most times can be relative. Yes, family relative. Now, in 2013, during my national youth service in Abuja, I came in contact with a 14-year-old teenager who shared a story of how at the age of 12 years, her auntie came to the village told her mom that she was going to take her to Abuja and, and, and the Roha in school. And more, the mommy believing that released, it, re, re, released her. And when she came to Abuja, uh, the auntie introduced two men who raped her. And that was how she started staying in brothels and involved in sex trafficking. And the proceeds always go back, uh, back to her auntie. And that was, that was, that was a story that uh, uh, prompted me to start a community project on human trafficking, which has also, you know, reached to the point where we established Deva Top Center for African Development. So traffickers are everywhere. They are very close to us than we can imagine. They, if you look at your neighborhoods, it can be see a trafficker there. They're everywhere. And one thing about them is that they can be an organized group of exploiters, or I call them deceivers, or a network of criminals uh, that are dedicated to exploiting the services of uh, others. Or they could just be individuals who exploit uh, others. You know, they must not just be a, an organized network. They can be individuals who 
are always exploiting the services of others. They could also be family operations. You know, some families operate businesses that are focused on exploiting uh, individuals. For example, people that own illegal orphanage homes where they traffic children. These are small family businesses. So trafficking network is not just global. It can be national or local, you know, you know, because trafficking is not just a global issue. It's also a national and local issue. So traffickers can operate in different levels. They can operate at the global level. They can operate at the national level. They can also operate at the uh, local level. And uh, from what I have studied, you know, with my years of experience, I have seen them as if they operate like networking businesses. If somebody, if you're familiar with networking businesses, you know, you have to, the more people you get, the more commission you, you get. Yeah, and people even invest. Most times they can coerce you to, you know, invest your, your future in a business. So these are how they operate. They have this ability to, you know, coerce, persuade uh, vulnerable people to, you know, risk their future in a fake uh, opportunity. So that's how they do. They recruit people, get commissions, others even invest in the money and also expect uh, returns. Uh, because of time, I would just like to highlight just three uh, major facts about traffickers and also share a few stories that will help us to know the reality of how traffickers operate. The first fact is that traffickers always study the, the challenges and wishes of their victims. They are studios, they study. Traffickers do operate as networking business. They target these vulnerable people and study them to know what their challenges, their family background and something that they could desire, they would desire. And then they now start using fake promises to trap the victims. Uh, in, in 2018, my organization handled a case of a, a young lady, probably um, 32 or something, who was trafficked from Anambra State to Mali to pick diamonds. <laughs> Surprise, you see how the trafficker has already studied her. And the trafficker heard from one of the states in the North Central. And she already studied the family and knew that the girl the dad is a single mother with two children. The family are not able to take care of her. And then this lady approached her that, you know, there's an opportunity in Mali to pick diamond wear and she could make over $2,000 uh, uh, every week. And maybe after working for four months, she could come back, you know, take care of her, her family, you know, even help her mother. And that was an interesting opportunity for her. And the worst part is that she paid herself, she paid through. She raised money, borrowed money, and paid half of what the trafficker requested, and then paid her, and that was how she was trafficked. Just to also let us know that in most times, even victims pay to be trafficked, not knowing that they are paying to be trafficked. So when she got to money, it was at that point she realized she was trafficked. She was among other 20 girls who were received in similar ways. And but fortunately, she was able to uh, return and the case was taken to court. We arrested the trafficker and the case had been in, in court. But these traffickers, one of the things I would like us to understand that traffickers come with very sugar-coated promises. You know, you know, they promise you good life and you end up seeing the, the worst part of it. Another uh, fact I would like us to know is uh, that traffickers utilize social media platforms to recruit and exploit their victims. Of course, you know that there are over 1 billion social media users uh, globally and uh, with 30 million users in Nigeria. And this is a huge opportunity for traffickers, you know, because it costs expensive. They don't need to spend money to travel to the local community to recruit their victims. They can just be in their home, use a social media platform, you know, study the way people post, you know, some users even post their family history, how difficult it is to survive. And these are opportunities for them because when they see this post, so okay, I think this should be a target. They introduce opportunities. And in 2018, I did a survey where I interacted with uh, survivors of uh, trafficking. And one of them shared a story of how he saw his classmates on social media posting some pictures of him in Russia with cars. But the man sent the picture to him and he was interested. He said, please, can I, how can I be part of this opportunity? And he introduced him to someone who posed as a helper. 
And the person is okay, I could help you travel to Russia, you know, they process the documents, and that was how he was trafficked. Another lady as well was doing, she was doing like hairdressing in Nigeria. All of a sudden, somebody approached her that see, with what they're doing, if you come to Belgium, you're going to make up to $2,000 every month. Why not leave this? And she closed her business, raised money, and paid herself through, and she was trafficked. So social media is a huge opportunity. It's, it, traffickers can use it without you know, much cost. And then another fact, which is the last one I would like to say, is that traffickers, trafficking network use female members to recruit victims. You know, society trusts women a lot. And according to IOM, female traffickers are often the ones who recruit women and children because sometimes they appear more, more trusted, more reliable, and more credible to this group. So if you see the number of people who have been trafficked, especially women and children, you see that there are mostly women that traffic them. That doesn't mean that men don't traffic. But in high number, women are regularly used to traffic women and children because they gain more trust from them. And then finally, please, traffickers do make orders. You know the way you make orders on Jumia? You know, because traffickers, most times, they also have connection with smugglers. And that is why, you know, smuggling sometimes can also lead to trafficking. Now, what they do is that they can order traffickers, they can order victims through uh, smuggling. Just tell the smuggler, please, as you are bringing people to Italy, um, we, I need two people. So what the smugglers will do, once they reach the destination and they get their pay, they say, okay, to the, to, to the migrant, okay, I have an opportunity for you. I have somebody who can help you. They now give the person the contact of a trafficker who pose as a helper to provide accommodation and job. And that's how trafficking set a place. So one of the things we need to understand that trafficking is evolving, is evolving, and traffickers are always innovating new ways you know, to traffic their victims. They are smart, they are social media savvy, and if we must fight them, we have to be smarter than them. And uh, I believe that together we can uh, uh, tackle uh, human trafficking. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joseph. That was mind blowing. I mean, trafficking is the next pandemic after coronavirus, and we must all together join hands to fight this hydra-headed monster. Um, before I turn it over to Emanuela, our barista, I would like to tell our, our audience, our viewers on Facebook, those following us, kindly drop your chats, your questions, and anything you would like us to know. Or if some comments are coming in, thank you for those of you that have dropped comments. Uh, Temitope is one of them. We would like many more of you to drop some questions for our panelists to respond to you. Um, Barista Emmanuel Uzon Dukwe, I'll turn it over to you now. Kindly give us your remarks on the experiences from the field, preventing human trafficking through the use of the media. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I want to appreciate the American Embassy for um, organizing this. Um, the issues of trafficking has really been uh, dear to my heart. I would like to start by saying that the United Nations protocol on uh, human trafficking and also the United States uh, Trafficking uh, Victims Protection Act stipulates um, some paradigm that is really important in the fight against human trafficking. And NAPTIP has also adopted that. So you have policy, you have prevention, you have um, prosecution, you have partnership. And all this is very important and protection of the victims also. So the role of prevention for me is really important. Some people would say, because you know, we say prevention is better than cure. And some people would say, you know, experience is the best teacher. But I, I beg to defer to that because you would it would be better if you learn from someone's experience than experiencing it yourself. You know, so um from my role in the work and working um as a producer and a presenter for the NAPTIP program, NAPTIP on the move, I I got to meet a lot of, you know, traffic people who have returned and, you know, children who have been recovered and just interviewing them is just so painful. <laughs> Most times you try, you're almost getting out of being professional because you're almost going to cry. I remember the case of a girl who was, um, who came back from Libya and her story was she was in a bus going for an interview or coming back from a job interview. So she had her international passport as part of her identification. And just someone in the bus, like my brother said, that they use women. 
and they began to talk about, oh, you know, Libya is rebuilding after Gaddafi, you know, so much money, you can get like $1,000 every month. You know, she was like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm interested. Why am I going to look for a job in Nigeria? You know, this is much better. And that was it. She didn't get home that night. I don't know what they did to her, but she did not get home that night. She was actually pleading, take me with you. And they made her swear, you know, and she went on that journey. By the time they got to, was it Mali or where? I can't remember now. And it was clear to her, it was sexual exploitation. And she was away from Nigeria for like eight years. By the time she was back, she had AIDS. You know, it was just crushing. And she's like, you know, going back to who, to where? They don't even know if I'm still existing. And, you know, that really got to me because I felt like, you know, these people can be anywhere. So even in a bus, just a bus ride, and you think you're with normal people, it was all planned out. And the lady that was helping convince her was nowhere to be found at the end of the day. So this is someone who unwillingly goes into trafficking. And one of the cases we covered, a girl that was also repatriated, her parents were upset. The mother said, no, you're going to have to go back and make money and build us a house. So, you know, the very hardworking uh, staff of Napti, they had to take her to protect her. So there are so many issues. So you have people who do not want to get involved. You have people who are actively involved. And the way I say it is like my brother said, if the story is too good to be true, you know what? It's actually too good to be true. It's not possible. You know, they come with all these big promises and then people get deceived and they get there. And that's the problem. And uh, I also remember covering a case of, uh, I think about 25 women who were about to be trafficked to the Middle East and they were rescued at the airport. These people were not grateful. You know, I really had to pity in after start because they were so upset. They're like, let us go, we have to go. Let us experience for ourselves this thing you're trying to keep us from. You know, it took a long time. And I said, you know, I said to one of them, so this Baba you said help is helping you. Where is he from? And she said, he's from, I can't remember whether North East or North Central, I can't remember. And I'm like, but you're from, you know, you're, you're a rag girl. So oh, he came to my, to my village to come and help all of us. I'm like, what? does he not have relations? Does he not have fellow villagers? Why would he leave his own village to come to, to you to help you? And besides, you're also going to pay for him to be able to. So what surprised me is, or what, you know, got to me, one of the women, she's like, I can't, I can't go back. She had a kiosk and a small salon and she sold everything to make this trip. So she's like, what am I going back to? She had left her children with her mom. And she's like, there's nothing to go back to. That is why we're fighting so hard to keep on this journey. So there's so many, so many instances. And for me, the lowest of low or the scum of all trafficking is child trafficking. And for me, that is so rife in Nigeria. So but from my experiences, I found, you know, in the North, you find um, a lot of the Almagiris actually traffic children. And in the, in the West, you find most people are trafficked to West African, neighboring West African countries. Then in the East, you have a lot of baby factories. That one is another ball game altogether. And it's just, it's just, it's, I don't know the words to use, but it's just so heart wrenching because some of these girls, they get pregnant and they go to these homes to help and they never leave there. You know, they keep them there, rape them and keep having, you know, making babies to sell to people. And then I also remember some case, that case really got to me. A young girl in Enugu, I believe, she helped her neighbor, her neighbor, okay, let me, okay, let me make it plain. So her neighbor has two children, but this neighbor, like we do in Nigeria, your children are not so important. You lock your house because you have to go out and your husband is out and you keep your children outside with a neighbor in a store. What's more important, the properties you're locking in or the children you're locking out? So this girl had, you know, she had like timed them and then when someone was like, oh, if you want money, I think she got like 250, some silly amount of money and she trafficked two siblings. And um, luckily they were found, you know, but she was arrested and everybody involved was arrested. But I just couldn't imagine that parents would lock out their children to lock in whatever possessions they think is important. And then we had a, a case of a small boy. It took eight months announcing before finally his parents came over. Someone has said, oh, let me take your child to train in Nigeria, you know, one of the cities. And it happened that um, they sold the boy to some woman. But there were cases that you would find uh, people, maybe a child in Kaduna abducted and sold to someone in, um, in the East. So that there's no how you're going to find those children at the end of the day. You know, there's so much going on. And for me, why it's important that child trafficking is addressed is because with adults, maybe with the program, people will call in, people you know, have numbers, adults will say, okay, this is what I'm going through. They may find a way to escape, but children don't know anything. And it's really, you know, it's really a sad case. I always remember uh, watching a kindergarten cop. I don't know if anyone watched that. I watched that growing up. And you know, the word never talk to strangers, that's very important. 
So parents have a role because the, the boy that took eight months before NAPTIP could identify or could you know, reunite with his parents, this boy um, could not say his name. He could not remember his name. He could not remember his father's name. He could not remember his mother's name, nothing. So it's something that parents have to take time, teach your children, you know, this is who you are. Maybe even your phone numbers, let them cram it and know it. But most importantly, tell them never talk to strangers. And then sometimes it may be nice people like the neighbor who traffic those children. So you never know, you know, so there's so many, so many cases that have come up and so many cases are still going on right now. But all I have to say is parents be on the lookout, people be on the lookout. If it's too good to be true, that's what it is. It's too good to be true. And these people have their own people. So why would they choose you to help you? And you know what's mind boggling is that some Nigerians, even when they are repatriated, will say, I want to go back. And I'm like, go back to what? Because you know, there, you know, there are issues of, um, well, I call it not being self-confident or not thinking you can make it even here. So you know, in all things with human trafficking, you have the push factors and the pull factors. So push factors is people watch TV and they think this is what it looks like abroad. That's a movie, that's make belief, but people do not know. So they see all of that, oh, they're, they're like, I'm going to go there, you know, money's growing on trees, you know, if I just hustle small, I'll make a lot of money. That's a lie. There are people who are homeless abroad, there are people who are poor abroad, there are people who have no opportunities abroad. So people really have to know this. That's what, they, they, that's how important the media is, to show the true light of what is what and how things truly are. They have the pull factors because some countries actually just pay lip service to human trafficking issues because they're getting very cheap labor. These people can't see you, you know, you disperse, dispose of them or dispense of them anytime, anyhow. You know, so these are the factors that are always causing these issues. So for me is nations getting serious and saying, this is not what we want. And then how do we address it? For me, the media is really important because if you prevent it's better than cure. If you tell people, like in the program, we had um, a victim story segment, where the victims themselves will come and tell you, this is what I have experienced. And they'll tell, you know, share their gory story. Some of them really thought it was really going to be beautiful. They ended up slaves. I don't think anyone will willingly want to become a slave to anything or to anyone. And so for me, the importance is if um, with the partnerships here, which is part of it, you know, foreign nations, everyone involved, you know, to keep helping NAPTIP because the message has to get out. For me, I'll prefer you have like a billboard, even at the airports, just warning people. So if you're going to get there, you know, this is where you're going. At least you have that consciousness that this may not just be what, you know, I'm expecting for my life to become. So I really want to thank God for this um, opportunity and to thank all of you because for me, trafficking is a call. Fighting trafficking is a call. It's something we need to look into. It's something we need to help, especially for me, the children. And what I've been doing in line with that is trying to make Amber Alert you know, uh, possible in Nigeria. Because if the Amber Alerts go off, then people will be able to retrieve those children faster before they go out, you know, out of circulation. Thank you. Thank you, Barista Emma. We have heard it from the experts. One of our participants also commented that human trafficking is fueled by poverty. And I agree, yes, poverty of um, information and also financial poverty. People feel the grass is always greener on the other side, but really it's not. And thank you for those of you who have been posting your questions. We look forward to more of them without waste of time. I'll also turn the mic over to Kanen Rampam. She is going to be discussing the economic empowerment, social inclusion, cyber connections as traffickers luring mine. Kanen, please, can you give your remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Thank you, Joseph and Emanuela. You, you did an awesome job. And if I could just quickly comment on some of the statements that have been made, I totally agree. I mean, we're in this advocacy market together. It's all too familiar, you know, the pull factors, the push factors, the stories that we hear. 
but we, we cannot ignore them. We have to keep reinforcing them and keep sharing them. As much as they re-traumatize us, we have to continue doing what we're doing. And it's awesome, Emanuela, that you're working towards an Amber Alert for children. Now, looking at traffickers, mine isn't so much, even though I hope to use a better part of the few minutes I have to share research that we recently concluded, even though we haven't published working with young children, especially in the area of prevention. Unfortunately, and fortunately, you cannot be fighting human trafficking and not working in most of the five, six thematic areas, which have to do with prevention, uh, rehabilitation, prosecution, and all that. Um, and and uh, just very quickly, yesterday we reunited a 13 year old with his family for the first time in five years, uh, talking about how traffickers can be used. Sometimes family members are used, we all know that. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. Now for this particular story, the father died, mother in her twenties with six children. So um, uncle comes around and picks up the male child, the first male child who was then about eight years old um, under the guise of um, taking him to take care of him, to ease the burden of, of care on the mother. Then a few years later, calls to inform the family that um, as part of his contribution to the uh, upbringing of this child and education, the child is going to Senegal for, to a religious school, an Islamic religious school. Now, usually when religion is used, it becomes really difficult for families to say no or for trafficking victims, unfortunately, to say no, they feel it's all good. Uh, it could have been a seminary, for instance, that this child would have been taken to. While the child gets there, there's no communication with the family. The details of the transaction, nobody knows, except this particular uncle and who, whatever else, a number of recruiters in between. This child gets there and eventually gets lost. The family is only told another year or two later that the child is lost miraculously and it's one of the greatest stories we celebrate and more coming up under the international organization for migration and uh, cpn family tracing and reunification program this child runs away on foot across a number of countries for about a year or two exposed to all the elements miraculously this child was found and and uh, yesterday, we were able to reunite the child with the family. It was difficult for myself and my team members to even fight back the tears. When we were working on the family tracing uh, segment phase of the project, when the grandmother, who was the primary caregiver, saw the picture, she burst out crying and asked where the dead body was found. Uh, but she was told, no, he was found alive. Now, looking at how traffickers can use, I want to help you. Uh, uh, life is too difficult for you. So let me pick this child and help. It's possible that some of the family members do not know that they are moving young people. I'm using your, it could be anyone, but in this case, young people from points A to B for the purposes of exploitation. They may not even know, but we know it happens, right? So back to the general scenario of how traffickers lure young people, they use secrecy. That's the number one thing traffickers use. And we try to tell many young people, like Emanuela said, if the offer is too good to be true, it's likely to be, to be true. Now, traffickers are ahead of all of us. So they're thinking of more convincing ways to let you know that offer of a better life, coming to work as a hairdresser or a, a model, whatever it is, is truly legit. Sometimes they actually have people in some of those countries whom you will speak with and they'll tell you, oh, that is the agency or the organization or the person on the other side. They could print up legitimate looking offers, job offers and show you. And you speak with somebody with a foreign voice. It is so convincing, traffickers ahead. Now, one thing to remember is the fact that they'll tell you, oh, don't, don't talk too much about it. You know, they'll be overwhelmed with requests from other people. Don't tell anybody, especially for young people. They'll say, don't even tell your family until it gets to the point where the traffickers feel they will need either consent or complacency from the family because they will need money from the family. That's when they'll meet the family and still play the same line with the family by saying, 
you know what? Just keep this between, between you. You know, there's so many other people who will need this offer, but you are the chosen ones, so don't tell people. So initially, it starts as innocent discretion. We all know if, if somebody is even moving, probably legally migrating to another country, they may not make so much noise about it. They'll be discreet. Now, that's how some of these traffickers come. They'll say, you know, we have to be discreet. We have to be sure first before we tell people. Then eventually they say, but don't tell anyone. Now, linking it to cyber trafficking, we know now we have 30 million, thanks Joseph for sharing that, 30 million uh, internet users in the country and the number is growing. A lot of young people love Android phones. They're not even so expensive anymore. They can get online. And yes, traffickers are there as well. So cyber trafficking is rife. Like Joseph said, very true. It'll cost them less. They just befriend these people online. They could send you any kind of letter you want to see online. And even though, yes, maybe it's through Facebook or whatever online platform, they will still tell you, don't tell anybody. Now, I want to share some statistics from, from the work we've been doing. We've engaged thousands of young people. We target mostly young people in secondary school, some in primary, but mostly secondary school. And um, some of the statistics are amazing. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to share the screen at this time, but I'll just read through some of the numbers that we got. Um, we had about, okay, um, a lot of young people in the city do know that some offers may not be very real. We were impressed to discover that about 82% of young people say they will ask questions. Now it gets more interesting. Now, will you, okay, first of all, sorry, 82% 82, 82 said they will be skeptical about traveling with a neighbor, a family friend, or a stranger. They didn't say they will not do it. They'll only be skeptical. Then only about 50% said they will actually ask questions and try to investigate if the offer is legit. This goes to show the level of vulnerability of especially young people. Another question was, uh, do you believe that poverty and low disposable income could be reasons why young people want to travel? And our research discovered that 79% of young people believe poverty is, is a factor while they will travel. That means this is something we also need to pay attention to. Are you willing to pay money to travel for a better life? Amazingly, 65% of young people that we engage said, yes, they're willing to pay money. More than 50% of young people are ready to give money to be trafficked, knowingly or unknowingly. Do you know the universal definition of corruption, which is actually the abuse of a position of trust? Many young people don't. About 62% don't have any definition at all, apart from what they hear in the news, and they can't even give it a real definition. Only 60% of young people do know the real definition of human trafficking, which is the movement of an individual from points A to B for the purposes of exploitation. The consolation we had when we came across this is the fact that, okay, what NAPTIP has been doing and civil society organizations like NAPTAL and the rest of them have been doing, we're seeing results. There's more awareness being built. However, more needs to be done because that 40 plus percent of young people who do not even know are much more vulnerable. And we asked if young people know what happens to people who are trafficked. Okay, the consolation is about 60% says said yes, they do know, but they don't have details. Fortunately, a lot of what they know is mostly coming from the media. So kudos to, to what Emanuela is doing and some of us who are also using the media to push um, awareness. Do they know the relationship between um, trafficking of children, HIV and AIDS? About 65% have no idea. However, those who are trafficked, even from the stories we've heard, are much more, about 70%, much more vulnerable to contracting HIV and AIDS. Whether they're being trafficked locally, moving in to live with relatives, it is the number is quite high and many young people are not aware then we asked do they know what trafficking cyber trafficking is 82 percent of young people do not know meanwhile this same percentage of young people are online with their android phones and other um, access devices they have to be online 
but they are very oblivious of the wiles of traffickers who befriend them. And we, we actually even asked if they know what catfishing is. You know, catfishing is basically people unseen who pretend to be who they are not for the purposes of exploiting the emotions or the vulnerability or whatever it is of another person they would have probably met online. Most of our young people do not even know what this means. Um, we asked if they know the difference between trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. Only 22% know that. 73% have no idea. Then it goes on, but let me just share a, a few other vulnerability factors that really, really stood out for us in, in our research with young people. Um, most of them do not know what sexual and reproductive health rights mean. They do not have safe spaces for such, either in their communities or homes or schools. And these are vulnerability factors that traffickers use to move ahead of the game and be able to package their offers to these young people. Um, let me just quickly pick um, a, a few others, then we, we wrap up. We, we actually asked if they know what the legal age of marriage in Nigeria is, and over 60% do not know. And we have a story of a trafficker who went to a community, contextualizing the cultures of that community. What he did was to, to court a young lady right out of secondary school, so in her late teens, and proposed to marry her. And he did all the traditional rites, and he was given this young girl in marriage, then immediately took her to Italy. And as we speak, she's probably spent her eighth year in an Italian jail because she was oblivious of all these facts. She had no idea and thought it's a better life. In, in fact, we were told that uh, she was sending money to the family for the first two years. Apparently this husband had forced her into prostitution, being oblivious of most of these vulnerability factors and realities. And of course he knew what to do when uh, the arrest, an arrest was going to be made and he was able to escape, but she was caught and she, she's still in jail. And we asked um, young people about uh, the vulnerability of especially people living with disability who are more susceptible to accepting offers. I have friends who are living with disability. Um, I have a few female friends who are um, physically impaired and some are confined to wheelchairs and engaging with some of them, some have said they have missed marriage offers because of their disability. Some have courted young men and when they're being introduced to the family, the young men are told, really, is this it? This person doesn't even have legs. These are beautiful, educated women. And um, they've gone into depression a couple of times. It's more work to even just try to function. Now, when somebody comes with an offer, look at your disability. You're beautiful, you're brilliant. I'll take you to a better place where you can work better, live better, and you'll be able to, you know, have people who appreciate you and will marry you and you will not be stigmatized. You know, where there's, there's that level of vulnerability that traffickers use. And about 74% of the people we interviewed said they did not even know the relationship between disability and human trafficking, uh, let alone have the numbers of what's actually going on, uh, which actually exists. Um, okay, so I'll, I, would, I would just leave it at that for now, but I thought it was interesting to share because there's been a lot of talk going on and there's a lot of effort that is being made by government and non-state actors, you know, different agencies coming together to work. We set up a, a strong research component in what we do so that we can our interventions can be intelligence-based, I mean, evidence-based, so that we can target them, you know, towards areas where there are huge gaps, especially in knowledge, especially when you're talking about prevention. And I'm sure my fellow advocates will agree with me that individuals who have been trafficked, though are now survivors, are not 100% the way they were before their exploitation happened. There's still that gray area that could cause a relapse. And you know, the person is, um, um, I apologize for using this expression, the person is sort of damaged goods. So that's why it's best to prevent it before it even happens. So um, Judith, I see your eyes rolling. So I know uh, 
you're, you're saying in your head, Kaneng, okay, so we have to stop here. So, uh, but, but very quickly, in terms of economic empowerment, you know, we have um, narratives that are slightly different depending on destination countries. I'm glad I heard one of the panelists mention the Middle East, and we've documented a few real life stories. And many Sorry, times- Kaneng. Yes, Sorry, Kaneng. Yes, hello. Yes, Judith. Can you hold your thoughts for a moment? I know some of the things you may be saying, we have um, questions lined up. So I believe some of the questions you are maybe about to answer them, but to give respect to our audience, would like to read out their questions, and the panelists to respond to. So um, our dear panelists, Joe, Kaneng, and Emma, please, uh, listen to the questions anyone which you think uh is directed towards you kindly respond accordingly we want to uh keep to time even though we're running behind schedule uh one of the first questions is from abigaila for humanity abigaila says campaign against human trafficking has not been prevalent especially in rural areas where they, the traffickers can easily cajole people because of lack of knowledge and exposure. What can you do to tackle this? Many cases have been reported in such environments. So I think what the person is trying to say is that people in rural areas don't really know about these tricks of traffickers. So what can we do to tackle this? Because many cases have not been reported in such environments. So that's one question. The second question is by Maduka Ekenna. It says, what are we doing in Nigeria regarding some cultural practices to support human trafficking within the country? Secondly, we all know that some of those being trafficked are due to better opportunities. What's the embassy doing to highlight the alarming rate of poverty in the country? The third question is coming from American Space Bauchi in Nigeria. Human trafficking is indeed complicated and a bit out of control. What's the way out? Juliet C. Chiruba says human trafficking enlightenment should be part of the curriculum of education from primary three and above from the grassroots. Town criers, radio jingles uh, should be deployed in local languages to disseminate information from the graduates and inculcated during the National Youth Service Corps as part of awareness programs. Um, Maduka is directing his question to Emanuela and any other person in the forum. You say, how are you navigating a situation where an individual is willing to be trafficked or exercise their right to migrate to enable them provide for themselves or their families? So people have a right to migrate, but what's the What's the line? Where do we draw the line between someone being trafficked and someone legally moving to another geographical area to be able to provide for themselves or their families? So um, to our audience out there, some of your questions have already been answered, but um, since one has been directed to Emanuela, Emanuela, I would like you to please respond to Maduka Ekena's questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to um, answer that question by um, sharing my experience with um, the girls who were going to be trafficked to the Middle East. Um, if you remember, I said they were like, no, you know, we have sold everything. This is the only opportunity we have to get out of here. And what I did was simply find some videos of, um, because we're going to be domestic helps in uh, the Middle East. So I found some videos of domestic helps. There was one that was, I think she was beheaded one, you know, <laughs> thrown down the staircase, her head, you know, just splattered everywhere. There are videos online. By the time I showed them those videos, they were like, no, this is not what we want. And I said, you're going to a place where you don't have the language, you don't understand what they're saying. You don't know who you're going to go to. You don't have anywhere, you know no one. You may not even have a phone to call back home. And I said to them, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, usually people say we're going to Italy, we're making money from Italy. I'm like, you have seen some people come back from Italy. Have you heard about returnees? or people who have come back from the Middle East and they couldn't answer those questions. So yes, you have a right to migrate, but what are you migrating to? You know, so when the facts are put before you and whoever is helping you, where are they? Because most of them, when they are caught or when the girls or when the pe people were apprehended, you know, the man ran away. So whoever is trying to help you, what is their motive? 
why couldn't they help other people? When you pose this salient questions to them, then they begin to think, you know, and now imagine that this, you know, could really go very bad. So for me, media, 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 public enlightenment cannot be overemphasized. You have to let people know, find pictures, find videos online, show people what has happened to other people before them. And that is enough to let them know this is not the way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, Joseph, can you kindly answer the question um, directed uh, from Abigail for Humanity? Um, talking about rural areas and people who are there and the vulnerability to traffickers. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, well, I partly agree with uh, what she said, uh, but it's important to know that trafficking, I mean, awareness is increasing. You know, it's going through different uh, community uh, communities, but the thing is that trafficking is evolving. For example, you are creating awareness that traffickers can come to your family and they prom give you promises. Now, traffickers are changing their methods. If our awareness is not evidence-based, just like Canon did, we may be missing it. You can be creating awareness about the tricks traffickers use, which they used 20, 10 years ago, but now they have shifted to new ways. So that's the, the challenge we have. And I'm not going to be that the fight against trafficking should be more localized. It shouldn't just be on national level. So both the local government communities, right, they should get involved. If we can localize the fights, that will help to reach more communities. And then I also want to say something about the economic way out. I think somebody asked a question. Well, one of the things we can do to address this, I mean, and the economic aspect of it is that we can do a sustainable social protection service, a program that is designed to provide the basic need of families living in poverty. I mean, something that is sustainable, not something that the first regime will do after four years, they will leave it. Something because what are the basic needs? Both, uh, um, uh, um, what do you call it? Electricity, education, food, um, hospital. All these are ways that by the time these are provided, it's easier when traffickers come and a family know that they are a bit comfortable. It's very hard for them to fall to their, to their tricks. So I think these are some things that we can do. Thank you. Hello, Judith. Thanks, Joseph, for your remarks. Um, we have another question from Luben Gena. What are the major stumbling blocks against human trafficking with particular reference to Nigeria? So Kanen, can you respond to that quickly, please? Thank you. Okay, if I get the question right, he's asking about the major stumbling blocks. I'll pick it from where Joseph left off, uh, the lack of social protection. From the research we conducted, almost 90% of young people, and this research was between 2019 and 2020, believe that uh, low disposable income is a reason to, to move to another community or move to another country, legally or illegally. So if we're able to secure the economy or to raise the disposable income of the average Nigerian, then we are reducing by, to a large extent, the vulnerability of the individual to be trafficked or the interest to travel to any country. By the way, it's important to note that migration is not illegal. However, it is the conditions under which people travel, travel without proper papers, travel without permission by the host country to be there, that's when it is illegal. So it is everybody's universal right to migrate and migration goes um, hand in hand with development. All of us have migrated from one section of our community to the other to get education, to get better jobs, it's happening is normal. However, of course, this illegal element that is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> feeding a $150 billion industry is what we're trying to address. And I wanna quickly mention that the story of the young lady, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who ended up in jail was actually in a rural community where, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I should have muted that. Um, you know, air went the wrong way. It's not Corona, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, so it was in a rural community in Plateau State, Bokos to be precise, where the awareness levels are really, really low. 
So yes, there's a lot of work to be done in rural communities. In 2012, we tried to engage the Ministry of Education to include it as part of human trafficking uh, education as part of the curriculum. We even said, okay, embed it in civic, civic education or social studies. But they told us it is such a long arrow, it might actually even take an act of Congress. So, <clears throat> excuse me, these are some of the things that can and should be done. Uh, if you're telling people don't travel, don't follow someone, uh, don't try to smuggle yourself into another country, what else are you offering them? Um, I want to share a quick fact. For, for a democracy to I even think survive. Kenya is experiencing low bandwidth. <laughs> okay, she's back. She's back. Okay. Uh, various agencies, civil society, various agencies should work to social protection. Government probably can do their own. But if we look inwards, and we consider how we can tap into the existing resources and opportunities we have. And they're so enormous. There are people in Nigeria who are becoming billionaires. In fact, in our research and, and, and interventions with young people, we actually have an economic empowerment component. We even ask them questions on how they can empower themselves. And we share stories of young people, even 13 year olds, that are becoming millionaires using coding, programming, and different other skills in Nigeria. So uh, there, there are no shortcuts to it, and there are no two ways about it. We improve the economy, we improve lives, we reduce the vulnerability. Of course, we need uh, values realignment across. Values are changing. Uh, a young person whose parents cannot afford a 50,000 naira phone is using an iPhone. Where and how? So these are some of the uh, push-pull factors locally that increase the vulnerability of especially young people to being smuggled, or being trafficked. I wanted to mention that globally, <clears throat> according to research, for our economy and democracy to be stable and be fair, the disposable income in the pockets of the average Nigerian or any human being anywhere in the world should be about $1,500 per month. Nigeria, if I can use our context, we've been struggling between two and 400 naira, uh, 400 dollars, I beg your pardon. Uh, there are other countries that have attained $4,000 um, as, as per capita income. So if we don't work towards achieving that, then we're increasing the vulnerabilities of our own people. There'll be increased crime and, and a whole lot of things that we cannot exhaust from now till next week if we're just listing the, the areas of vulnerabilities. So really that's what we need to do. And people need to ask questions. The truth is in our awareness building, Joseph, Emanuela, our various networks and other agencies we're working with, we will just keep reinforcing the fact that there's no work out there waiting for you. If there's a job that is waiting for you, there are proper channels to go about it, not individuals picking you off the street, visiting your home or your school and making outrageous offers. Like Emanuela said, there's poverty out there. I've been in the US, I've been in different countries. There's poverty everywhere. Every country is trying to balance up, reduce poverty and you know, um, uh, empowerment of their citizens. So people just need to remember that the grass is actually greener here. Um, if, if you want to really enjoy life, make your money here, then go spend it elsewhere if you want, you know, travel. That's right, that's right, Kadeng. Thank you. Thank you so much. The grass is indeed greener here. And the way you make your bed, that's how you're going to lie on it. So let's use all the resources available to us here in this country, our great country, Nigeria. We are so blessed. Yes, our fingers are not equal. We may not have what we desire at the moment, but if we work at it and keep faith alive, we will not find ourselves as victims of trafficking. And above all, contentment. We must all be contented. There was a last question which was asked by Vera Onyeka. I'll just read it out. Vera, we're going to drop responses, uh, a response to your question on our Facebook uh, page. So you can check uh, the response to your question, but we may not be able to respond to it on this program. Uh, Vera asks, how can we improve the justice system uh, so traffickers are caught and punished, maybe stringent punishments like life imprisonment? to discourage others. I believe that question was directed to Barista Emma. Uh, Emma is gonna answer your question, Vera. So please bear with us. I'm going to turn over the mic now to Meg to give the closing remarks. 
Thank you so much for being with us on this program. Meg. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Judith, for that wonderful work. Um, this is a burning issue, and I know if we'll stay here till next year, we'll just keep talking. There are just too many problems surrounding trafficking in prisons, but um, God will help us. Oh, okay. So I want to say a very big thank you to all of you that sacrificed your time to be with us here today, particularly all the participants that abandoned all they had to do to get connected to this event. It's because of the passion everybody has towards covering this menace. Um, I know the DG, Nap Naptip sent a representative to be among us online today. I want to appreciate you very highly for your presence. And I know you'll take word to your organization and whatever you've heard today would be useful to you as you continue the fight. I want to also say a very big thank you to my bosses, Malia Hero and Alison Mackin. Alison is a um, regional public engagement specialist from Ghana, US Embassy in Ghana. She's my regional boss. She's also um, one of the participants here today. And I want to say a very big thank you for all the support you've been giving me to anchor different events. Um, yes, so my very skilled and excellent speakers this is another way of giving back to the society. I want to appreciate you so much. Joseph Osiwe, you have um, continually given us the, the cause to know that yes, we actually did a very good selection process by selecting you to attend the IBLP program on human trafficking. You've always been um, giving in your best. Thank you so much. And Barisa, Mrs. Emanuela uh, Ndukwe. Thank you. Um, it's the time difference. Yeah, you, jo you, you are awake in US to join us now. We know it's a lot of sacrifice, leaving your baby on in the bed and coming to join us. Thank you. We'll call on you anytime and we know you will answer us. Mrs. Kanen Wang, fam. Awesome. Thank you. We are here and then we'll continue to anchor these programs over and over at different times. And we'll always call upon you and that we know we'll continue to partner together. Um, all my colleagues from the uh, IO team, on the IO session, we want to say thank you. Joseph is here. Thank you, Ola. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to Jean for all this. Um, super technical support. Um, everybody that is here, I would want to let you know that our programs continue to uh, come up from time to time. And our next event that we'll be preparing for will be the Black History Month event. And uh, I urge you to please stay tuned. And then um, I'll be sending out the announcement anytime. And when I send out the announcement, please pass it to as many as you can. And there's always a sign up link to participate, to become members of the American Center at the US Embassy. It is from the membership link, the membership database that I connect to um, contacts and invite them to such programs. So please look out for the link for the membership and um, connect to us. And we'll, together we shall uh, bring about the change we are all fighting to, to make in Nigeria. So once again, I want to say a very big thank you. I appreciate you all, all my partners and everybody. And uh, at this junction, we've come to the end of today's program. 
So thank you and thank you again.